Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you guys on. I hope you guys are ready to learn about school choice. <laughs> Uh, and some it'll just be kind of touching up some stuff. Um, feel free if you've got questions to please interrupt and ask. I very much just want this to kind of be a conversation between us. And so anything you guys want to know about, feel free to stop me. And here we go. So we have two types of school choice here in Arkansas. We have the Public School Choice Act of 2015. Um, and which is what the most of our appeals are for. I actually don't have any opportunity school choice uh, that will be on the 14th for our meeting in July. Um, and then we have opportunity school choice. And those are the two code sections at which you can find both of those laws. All right, Public School Choice Act of 2015. So important vocabulary for anybody who doesn't know is you've got a resident district and a non-resident district. And the resident district is the district at which the individual actually lives. That's where they reside. The non-resident district is the district where they want to go. Um, so students are allowed to transfer into a non-resident district. When they successfully transfer, they can actually complete their entire education in that non-resident district. Um, school choice applications are only required once. Once you successfully transfer in, you do not have to do a school choice application again, unless you leave the non-resident district. Now, if you leave, you'd have to go through the process again, but as long as you get in and you stay, you're good to go. Our timeline. So applications are due no earlier than January 1 and no later than May 1st. That's in the law, that's statutory, it has no exceptions. The superintendent of the non-resident district is supposed to notify parents as of no later than July 1, whether or not they have been accepted or rejected into their district, um, which July 1 is Friday. So most districts don't wait that late, of course. Most of them have went ahead and done that, but I do have some straggler districts that I know of um, that kind of have pushed to that deadline. Um, applicants can appeal a rejection, and that's appealed to you guys. Um, the appeal has to be done in writing and it has to be postmarked no later than 10 days after they receive the denial letter from the non-resident district. So applications, this is an issue we have seen before as well, that they have to be submitted to both the non-resident district and the resident district. Now this is something that is the parent's responsibility to do. It's not the responsibility of either of the districts to contact each other to be sure that these applications were submitted. Um, the application, once it's received by a district, is supposed to be time stamped and then they are supposed to be considered in the order in which they are received. Um, and then public school choice applications do not have to be submitted to DESI. That was, there's been some confusion with that. We don't actually get them here. They just go to the districts. So at boards, school boards, have to pass resolutions for how they accept or reject applications. Um, some of the standards that they can include for rejection would be lack of capacity, um, which would be if a school district has reached 90% of its maximum authorized student population for a program, a class, a grade level, or its school building. Um, and it also has to include a statement regarding sibling priority, meaning that if you have a, we'll get more into this later, but a sibling priority is basically if you have a sibling that has choiced into the district, then unless you are at capacity, if, they're, if they have a younger sibling or other sibling that choices in, goes through the appropriate steps, files that school choice application, then they are admitted unless you do not have capacity. So uh, standards though cannot include for acceptance or rejection, anything to do with academic achievement, anything to do with athletic ability or extracurricular abil abilities. Uh, English language proficiency. Previous disciplinary, disciplinary proceedings can also not be included except for an expulsion from another district. Now this is in the case of if the child was expelled into the next school year, you can't then try to move school districts and be like, well, I want to go to this school. No, you've been expelled, so you are not qualified to go to any school. Um, the receiving district also shall not discriminate on the basis of gender, national origin, race, 
ethnicity, religion, or disability. And that's specifically enumerated in that law. So that sibling priority. Siblings are giving priority for transfer into a non-resident district as long as they are a present or future sibling and they, that, has, that already attends that non-resident district. They have to reside in the same household as the student seeking the transfer. Um, and that's the code section where that can be found. And the only limitation is capacity at the non-resident district. Um, and then if you are denied transfer into a non-resident district, you are supposed to receive priority for the next year to apply for school choice. Do I have any questions from anybody before we get into limitations? I do have a quick question and I'm sorry if it's loud. I'm on vacation and my kids are at an aquarium. So that's why you see this lovely blue behind me. Um, back on that one, they do have to reapply though, correct, for the next year. They can't, they're not automatically just given priority for, to get into the non-resident district, correct? Correct. They do have to go through the application process, but they are supposed to be, I don't know, I'm assuming the districts earmark these kids and tell them okay. if you apply next year, you have priority to go first, basically. Okay. So our limitations on school choice are, we've got a 3% cap, a lack of capacity, and then that federal court order. So the 3% cap is, it is a numerical set limit that's per school district uh, each year. This number is found in a commissioner's memo that we release, um, and it's based off enrollment numbers on October 15th of, the, of that preceding year. So this year, that was the commissioner's memo where, that, where those numbers were released. Um, the number is a net, meaning that it has to be calculated based on how many students they get in versus how many students want to go out. So the example there is if you have a, if your number is 41 based on that commissioner's memo, then that means you have to allow 41 students out. But if you have 38 who choice out and three who choice in, then you've actually only lost 35 and you still have to allow up to 41 to leave your district. Now, where this becomes an issue is that they only have to allow up to that max number out, so that 41 out, but that 42nd is where they can start denying, which is what most of our school choice appeals are. That's why they've been denied, is based on cap. So sibling groups, again, are afforded a special privilege, um, and that is because if the, if the application that would cause a school district to reach its cap is a sibling group, um, the school district has to allow, if it can allow one of them out, but let's say that, let's say that, that last child, first child in the sibling group is that 41st child. Well, if you can allow one of them out, you have to allow all of them to leave. You cannot separate siblings when they're attempting to choice out of your district. Um, and that 3% cap only applies to public school choice. So I'm sure there are probably some questions about cap. This, this is the biggest thing that we have that comes in. So... You got anything for me? <laughs> I do, and I and I see this every year. But a lot of times we'll have someone denied by their resident district, but they didn't attend that resident district in the year before. Uh -huh. And so I always have it's, it's always hard to to think about that because they're not in that denominator when that number was created. Um, but we, there's nothing about whether you actually ever attended your resident district is there no that that is not enumerated in the law um and i know we have lots of kindergartners that that's no. that's exactly it they're denied based on cap and they want to appeal that and that's some things that they put in their letters is that well this happened and we've not even ever even been in this district but the law doesn't state that it it just says it's a three percent number the numbers are released by us here at desi and so school districts just roll with that number okay and then within that, there's nothing, is there anything stopping a district from allowing more than that 3%? No, there is not. If a school district that's wants to allow more, good. that's perfectly fine. They just okay. have to allow that 3% out. Okay. Okay. And they're allowed to accept as many, there's no cap yes. on how many you can accept, is there? No, there's not. The, the limitation then would just be capacity. Right. You know, what, what can your school hold, what, you know, your class size, your teacher load, that kind of thing. Okay. 
Thank you. This is really helpful to refresh all these issues before we see it. Thank <laughs> You're you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm glad. And feel free if you got anything else to, to just hop in there. Okay, thank you. So getting back to capacity, a lack of capacity is when a school district has reached a 90% maximum of authorized student population in a program, class, grade level, or school building. So, you know, that's, that's just based on, you know, what, what grade the child is going into, what their buildings look like. That capacity is going to look different for each, each school. It's going to look different. So we also have desegregation orders or plans, um, which this is something that a school district that claims a conflict, meaning that they want to say, we don't have to participate in school choice because we're under an active desegregation order. Um, they have to submit proof of a federal court order to the division showing that they have a genuine conflict and their court segregated approved plans they have to explicitly limit transfers of students between school districts. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the only one, we have a consent decree that limits, this is a good example, between Camden, Fairview, and Harmony Grove. And it basically says that white students from Camden, Fairview cannot choice into Harmony Grove. So the two districts have decided, because that limitation is in a consent decree, and that is an active decree, that they will just not do school choice between the two school districts which we don't have any of those cases before us so this is really just a refresher for you guys we don't have anything involving a desegregation order and um, the next set of slides is going to be the garland county order we actually don't have any cases as of right now before you guys that have to do with any of this i just wanted to include it so that you guys had a good overview of what our laws look like um, so that garland county order it's the Garland County Districts. They are under active desegregation order. That is the court case, the latest court case um, from this order. And it requires that their school choice transfers actually have to be conducted under the Public School Choice Act from 1989, which actually was repealed here in Arkansas in 2013. Um, the State Board does remain a party in the Davis case. And as a part of that Davis case, the consent decree, uh, they remain under that 1989 act. So these are the school districts that are involved in that. They're the ones within Garland County. Um, like I said, we don't have any from them, so we don't have, we haven't had to do any of the things that are required in the 1989 Act. Um, I've got two more slides that actually list out what that Act requires us to do. Um, but like I've said, we don't have any before us. So it basically has a race percentage that you have to calculate, um, which we would do here to ensure that you know, we'd go through a whole process with it, but thankfully we don't have any of those before you guys um, that we have to do. So there is also a military exception for school choice, both opportunity and public school choice. And it says that if a parent or guardian is an active duty military member who has been transferred to and resides on the military base, then their, the parent can actually file an application for public school choice as long as they do it within 15 days of arrival on base. They can do that outside of that uh, timeline in statute that's no earlier than January 1 and no later than May 1st. So that is the military exception. Now they do have to provide military transfer orders and proof of residency on base. That's the biggest stickler with that is that they have to be living on base. And that's in the code, that's, that's not our rules, that's specifically enumerated in the code. Okay, so the big thing that gets to us is when there is a rejection and then we have an appeal. So an appeal can be brought to the state board to reconsider the application. The request has to be made in writing and it has to be postmarked to the division no later than 10 days, excluding weekends and legal holidays, um, after a notice of rejection under the code has been received. And now that notice of rejection has to be received by the non-resident district because that's what the code says. So the non-resident district sending out a notice is what triggers that 10 days. Uh, they have to submit theirs right here to the division. And then along with filing the written notice, they have to also include um, a copy of their rejection notice and then they're supposed to mail a copy to the superintendent of the non-resident district. I go through the process though of when I receive uh, an appeal, I notify both districts, so both districts are immediately put on notice that we have an appeal, um, and then I subsequently follow that up with a hearing notice um, for when they will be expected to come be before the board. 
Um, so, and again, they have a timeline for when they are supposed to submit responses. Um, but honestly, if someone wants to submit something that is outside of those 10 days, we take it for parents or districts just because we want you guys to have the most information possible when you're making these decisions. Now, an application that is not timely filed is not appealable. Um, and not timely filed would be if they do not submit their application to the, not, the non-resident and resident district by May 1st, then that is not timely and you cannot appeal that. So if, it, if an application has been rejected for not being timely, it cannot be appealed to you guys. Okay, so before we jump into the Opportunity Public School Act, does anybody have any other questions about public school choice and about appeals? Well, I, I do because I'm trying to think through and, and I'm hoping you can help me with this. How are we, how does this affect our virtual schools? I know we have a class size limit and teaching load, um, but again, how does this affect, or does it affect our virtual schools? So, or a virtual, or a virtual class, or, yeah. So, as far as the virtual goes, um, the enrollment cap, the, that 3% cap is the 3% cap. So, that that is the number, if they have, we haven't talked about virtual options. Um, Lori's going to come help me with the virtual aspect. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Ms. McFedrich. Good morning. Hi. It, when we're looking at school choice as far as capacity, which I suspect is what you're asking about, the capacity is going to be considered the actual physical number of kids that can be in that school. You know, it, it's... I know that last year we came into a situation where a school district claimed lack of capacity, but they were able to discuss the fact that maybe a kid could go into vir the kid could go to virtual anyway, and I think the, the student might have. But the virtual programs, those are just, you know, that's an extra added benefit for the students who are attending the school because we have to allow any student in a virtual school to come virtual to come back to the regular school the brick and mortar school when they want to. So when we do not bring the, the virtual numbers in when we're calculating percentages, it's just, you know, specifically the number of kids that are in the brick and mortar school. Did I, was that clear? Yes, yeah. Okay, no, okay I wanna make sure I answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, no, that helps, thank you. I do have another question. That was helpful on the virtual. Thank you for bringing that up, Kathy. Um, so sometimes we have families that move in the summer, and so they miss that January to May deadline. There's no, there's nothing around it that if you were to move into a new resident district over the summer hours that you could fall in, under this. Is there? No. Um, now, if I there is there are other vehicles that they could use. There are board to board transfers that they could attempt to right. get. Um, but no, ma'am, if they fall outside of that May 1st deadline, unless they are military and reside on the military base, there is no exception to that deadline. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, then we will plow on to opportunity. So opportunity school choice, the eligibility for that is if, a, if the student's resident district has been classified by the State Board of Education, as a school or district in level five intensive support or their school has received an F rating. Now, this information is found on my school info, but for the past two years, we don't have those F ratings due to COVID. Um, so really all we look at for this year would have been that level five intensive support. Um, and now this, this has the same deadline. It's no, no earlier than January 1, no later than May 1st. Um, the superintendent of the non-resident district has to notify the applicants whether or not they have been accepted or rejected. Um, and then rejections, again, can be appealed to you guys. It's the same thing with public school choice. We tried to make these two laws identical in procedure. Um, the only difference is, is that the limitation on opportunity school choice is 95% capacity. Um, and it's that same thing with your school program, your building, same type of capacity, it's just at a 95% for opportunity school choice instead of the 90 that it is for public school choice. 
Um, and again, you have the military exception in this regard too, um, but it just requires that they have to file that application within 15 days of arrival on base and they have to be residing on the base. Now, Opportunity School Choice has a little bit of different, it has an inter-district transfer, which is if you were a child, if you had a child that was at a school with an F rating, they could transfer to another school within your district as long as that, that school didn't have an F rating. But like I said, we don't have those ratings for the past two years due to COVID, so that's not something that is relevant for this set of appeals. Um, now, if a district is classified as level five intensive support, your transfer has to be outside of that district. You can't just transfer to another school within the district if the entire district is in level five intensive support. Um, and it's the same thing with an appeal. It's the same procedure that if you appeal, you can do it in writing once you've received that rejection from the non-resident district, as long as it is postmarked no later than 10 days. Um, which is, of course, it excludes weekends and legal holidays. And it's the same thing. If the appeal is not, if, if you don't file your application on time, you can't appeal it. But otherwise, that is, that is the quick and dirty, I believe, <laughs> of school choice. So are, are there any questions? I did. I thought of another one going back to the capacity, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. So sometimes there'll be, you know, the capacity will be set, but then when August comes, numbers fluctuate. Mm -hmm. Do districts have the ability to have like a wait list that, you know, if it's not because of three percent cap, but it's because of that capacity, that that student can be on a wait list that if the capacity changes in August, or is it a hard, fast the capacity that was predetermined and it's a hard and fast they reject based on capacity um, and a lot of times at least the ones that I have seen the ones that you will have coming before you this year the capacity issue is based on if we accepted these students we would have to hire more teachers so okay. that that became the issue and it wasn't just one teacher it is we'd have to hire multiple new teachers um, because of the grade level that these students are wanting to go into um, so you and there's no that. mechanism to put, you know, put that kid on a wait list if, you know, an enrollment was happened to be lower in August, they could get bumped in. There is not one in place at this point in time, no ma'am. Um, and I believe that's because, you know, your start date is right there in August. And so you really need to know, you know, parents need to know and school districts need to know where these kids are going. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question and you may have already answered it because my internet connection is, is popping in and out. But we've had um, districts before that have said that they would have to hire a special education teacher or a special education aide, but that should not be on the application. How do we handle those issues? Um, so let me see if I understand your question correctly, um, because I can't quite, uh, I can't hear you super well, Ms. Newton. Um, so you're asking if they deny based on having to hire a one-to-one -one aid or a special education teacher, um, how do you deal with those types of situations? Right. Okay. Yes. Um, so it is the division's understanding um, that, of course, you cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. That is specifically enumerated in our public school choice law. Um, and then a one-to-one -one aid would be a related service under the IDEA. So as that you cannot discriminate on that basis and you have to provide those services. Does that okay. answer your question? Yes, so if they had to, if they had to hire a special education teacher, that would not be a reason that, that they could deny. So it's different when it's an actual teacher. Lori? So to give you a little bit of context, I think where Ms. Newton's question is coming from is last year, we had a district that basically accepted the student and then we found out after they had been accepted that they were a special needs student and so then they were trying to say that they didn't have capacity for the student because they would have to hire a teacher so i think that's where a lot of this is coming from just to give you context on because i'm very interested in the answer to this as well thank you yeah um <clears throat> on the issue of whether like there would have to be another teacher hired for a self-contained classroom i don't think the law is really it's the law is not really clear on that I mean, if a, that could turn into an IDEA or Section 504 violation, you know, it's just when you're talking about an actual teacher, it's, I mean, 
It's not really clear. That's in the law. That would be something that I'm sure would end up in the court somewhere. So, but if something gets appealed to us and we basically find out that their reason for not accepting the student is based upon the fact they'd have to hire a special education teacher, that is not appropriate. We should go ahead and allow the transfer if all of the other facts are at play. At this point, I would say we don't have a situation like that in any of our appeals. And so in an abundance of um, kind of trying to be like the Supreme Court, not answering questions right now that we don't have to, you know, if they had to hire a, a teacher, uh, you know, not just an aide, but an actual special ed teacher, you know, we would wait. I mean, I'd prefer to wait to, to look into that more and see if the law develops more on that issue. I mean, it, I don't mean to be giving you the run around or not answering the question, no, but I, it's not going to be I totally there. understand that. That's fair. That's a, and I mean, I know what we did last year, and we basically said, no, you have to take the student. So I was just kind of looking for further guidance on whether or not that was a good call or not. So. Yeah, and I mean, then that is, you know, a call that the board made, and the board has the right to make that call, and certainly the school district can appeal that to the circuit court if it wishes and there was no appeal to the circuit court on that if there was maybe we would have gotten an, a, a specific answer to that question but there was no appeal so that's a good thing thank you thank you Ms. Lewis. that's sort of clear as mud to me Can we go through, I do have another question just on the cap. Can we go through a scenario? Like if we had a hundred students in a district, what are we saying? Let's say that their 3% is, what is that? Three students, something like that. Yes. So they're allowed to take in three students, but they also have to let three students go. No. So do I understand cap, that? Okay. I'm sorry. So the cap doesn't go to how many students you take in. The cap is just how many students transfer out. So let's say that, so three is their number, and let's say that they have four that apply for school choice. So the, the fourth one shouldn't be allowed to transfer out. They don't have to allow that fourth one to go. However, if they have two that transfer into their district, well, there's four that went out now, just went down to two. You've only lost two, actually, because you gained two in and four out. So you've actually only lost two. So you can still stand, you can still, legally, you still have to let one more go <coughs> if they ask to go. It's a net number. Got it. Okay. But it, yeah. it so doesn't. Cap, any, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sutton. I was just going to say so the cap only applies to the resident district. Yes. Okay. Yes, the cap is only for losing. Um, the non resident district, it would be more that capacity than cap. Which I know it's confusing because one's capacity and one's cap and they sound very similar. <laughs> um, and so that was something that I had to learn when I first got here. Um, but yes. So are we are we seeing a lot of these appeals from those people that are not being released from their district? Is that where a lot of these, where the rub comes from, from a lot of these smaller districts that are losing students and they've already exceeded their cap? And so people are appealing. Do I understand that correctly? Yes, ma'am. That is the majority of where our appeals come from. Got it. Okay. I follow you. So how does the number of appeals that we're apt to look at next month, uh, uh, what does that buy? So we have, as of right now, we have 17 appeals. That's how many I have. Um, that number of course could change. You know, we could have districts that work it out amongst themselves. And um, we could have districts that just decide to release the kids. Um, anything could happen. Um, I have so far, we have managed to work out 10 appeals. So that that's a woohoo around here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to get things worked out. And I have one of that 17 that I believe is going to work out, but I just went ahead and included it for, you know, just in case it doesn't. Because the, the time to appeal has passed. Is that correct? Um, so are you asking how many times an appeal has been successful in previous no, years? No, no, no. If, if a student or their family was going to appeal, they would have, that time has passed now. If, they, if you have an appeal by now, it's not gonna be heard. Well, see, it's determined based on when that non-resident district sends out that rejection notice. 
So for the most part, most districts have went ahead and done that, but the non-resident district actually doesn't have to do it until July 1, which is Friday. So we could oh. potentially have some stragglers coming in, but for the most part, the bigger districts um, have already done that, so. Okay, I see, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm sorry. Can we talk about capacity now? Sure. I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, so what is the basis for a school rejecting a transfer of students in? It has nothing to do with CAP, correct? Or are the two intertwined? So normally if it is capacity, a lot of times that's going to be a non-resident district that rejects. And so it, the CAP is not an issue for them. Um, CAP is generally from the resident district. Um, it's always going to be the resident district who, who denies the transfer based on that cap number. Capacity will come from the non-resident district. I got to come up with an acronym or something for that. So capacity <laughs> is non-resident, cap is resident. Yes. Okay, got it. We needed a better name besides cap, really. <laughs> I guess we could call it the net number instead of the cap number, but... I'll try to help you on that acronym, um, Adrian. Right. On, the, on, on the capacity issue, if I, I, a family has a second grader and a fifth grader, and the fifth, grade, uh, fifth grader gets accepted, but the second grader gets rejected, there's no, because of uh, capacity, there's no, um, there's no part in the law that would make them take the whole sibling group based on capacity. Um, we don't have a situation like that as of right now, um, because generally when you have a, when you have a sibling group choosing in, um, I, what I have seen is school districts either take all the siblings or they take none of the siblings. That is what I've seen with sibling groups. Um, there's nothing enumerated specifically in the law that would capture that second grader if it is a capacity issue. Um, but like I said, that's not something we have. That's not an issue I've got before you guys, um, next month. So that's just something I, we'd have to deal with when it came to that point. Well, we, the only reason I asked, we've seen that in the past, and I didn't know if there was any part in the law now that would take care of that. No, there is a there is a priority for siblings if you already have a sibling that's in the district um, that it <clears> captures <throat> those kids unless there's not capacity. But even that lists capacity as a reason to deny. So there's nothing as of right now enumerated in the law that would solve that situation. This may be a question for, for Lori, or you might know the answer. Last year we had an issue when it actually came to procedure, and I'm, I'm, I think we got it worked out, but it was basically on notice on whether it was the resident district or the non-resident district. Did we clarify the onus is on the parent, right? To ensure that both districts got notice? Yes, that is, is that correct okay. in the law and um, that it is no. the parent's responsibility to take the application to both the non-resident and the resident district. Um, and we're is there any, go ahead, Ms. Wood. No, I'm sorry, I interrupted, no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna tell you where it is. I mean, it's clear on our form that you have to do both. Uh, but we're going to even rework it to maybe change the colors, bold it out, um, because that was a question that we got a lot on if you had to send it to both districts. So, I think last year the issue was people were using old forms. Um, and I know there was conversation about we're going to clarify that in the future. Is there any sort of requirement that it be certified or return receipt or anything like that? Or it just says it's on them to prove that they sent it to both? There is no requirement in law that they have to send it certified. It's not in our rules that they have to send it certified. Um, so that would just be on them if that was an issue to be able to prove that they had done this. Um, thankfully, I only had one issue like that that came up, but it ended up working itself out. The school districts did a board to board transfer because that was in the best interest of the students. So. Well, this has been helpful to me. Well, I'm super glad that it was helpful. Um, and if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm the school choice person. Um, 
I wasn't here last year, so I don't, I don't know what you guys did. You know, I don't know how it was handled last year. So I, I hope that, I hope that you guys like the way that I presented it to you. And um, I look forward to being with you guys on July. And hopefully we can maybe get some of these worked out. And maybe they'll never make it before you guys. And but we'll do what we have to do. So that'd be perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This thank is you. Good. Good before our next meeting. I appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Does, does this conclude our meeting? That's all I have for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for getting all this together for you. We, we appreciate it very much. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, yeah. everyone. I will tell you, I will have a cheat sheet for you guys um, that'll be a real quick that you can look over um, before we start into the appeals on the 14th, so. That would be great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Is that all, Ms. Newton? I think that's it. Okay. We'll see you in July. Y'all have a happy fourth. You too. You too. Same to you all. Bye.